All right, so uh, I wanted to thank the organizers, uh, Sharon, Vasilis, Eugene, and Noah for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, today I would like to tell you about light-induced uh, insulating states and the dynamics of optically pumped metals. I started this work as a postdoc at Columbia, and then I continued when I moved to Stanford as a more fellow, and now I teach at San Diego as an assistant professor. Uh, the work at Columbia was done with Andy Millis, David Reichman, Dante Canis, and Benedict Kloss. The work, there's new work that will appear hopefully soon with the LMU unit group with the student, Matteo Marador, a postdoc, Sebastian Peckel, that are in the group of Holly Schulwalk, and there are some collaborations with the Mitterrand group here at Harvard. So um, today what I want to tell you, I want to emphasize that it comes from non-linearities. These are very important in pump probe experiments. We already heard that from Andreas' talk. The type of non-linearities I will emphasize today is non-linear that conform and cover. And here's an outline of my talk. I will not have time to cover all of this. Uh, so I will try to spend most of my time uh, try to tell you the why we're doing this, why we're excited about this, um, the pump probe experiments of quantum materials. Then I will discuss a model of this non-linear behavior. I will, in particular, focus on what happens if the phonons are relatively fast and how that leads to some dynamically induced disorder. Then I will show you very fast results on this. I unfortunately will not have time to get into those details, but I'm happy to talk about it. So let's get started. Um, as you heard from Andrea, the idea here is you use light. It's a classical field. The pump is uh, ultra fast. It pumps specific modes in the, in the crystal. It can be mode selective. It can select ex specific excitations you're interested in. For example, <coughs> here it's selecting some specific uh, phonons, intermolecular or intermolecular <coughs> phonons, and it can do this coherently without doing any thermodynamics. And when you excite that phonon, the, that excited phonon now is coupled to the electrons, so it can dump its energy into the electronic system and quench the electron dynamics. You get some <coughs> interesting dynamics and you get some interesting novel transient phenomena. In the long time limit, uh, at least uh, most, under, the most common understanding is that the staple thermal. So we're actually interested in the transient in these systems. And to give you examples of what you can get, you can get a metal to a superconductor transition and so on. And of course, then you come later with another pulse, the pro pulse, to measure what you've seen uh, to interpret uh, the transient state. So here's a very famous uh, experiment from the Cavallari group led by Matteo Mitterano in Nature in 2016. Uh, they took K3C60. K3C60 uh, has a TC at equilibrium of 20 Kelvin, or about 20 Kelvin. So at equilibrium, which is you're seeing on the left here, below TC, the metal, the material is superconducting. Above TC, the material is metallic. And here is a sigma two measurement. Nothing uh, extraordinary or unconventional about this uh, measurement. What you're seeing here in red is the uh, high temperature response, and in blue, the low, the low temperature response. And you're seeing the one over omega divergence at near zero frequency. So this is indicative of superconductivity as it should be, as has been documented over and over. The remarkable thing is they did the same experiment at 100 Kelvin. 100 Kelvin, K360 is definitely metallic. And they did two types of experiments. One without light, that's the red line. You're getting basically the same response as on the left-hand side here at equilibrium, which is not surprising. And then you pump the system. And when you pump, you're getting this uh, uh, divergence at zero frequency again, which is very suggestive of superconductivity or at least superconducting behavior at these high temperatures. So that instigated the topic of light-induced superconductivity. And I want to use this as a motivation to study this problem. Uh, let me advertise. I'm going to simplify the features of K360 too much. So it's unlikely that I will that whatever I'm going to tell you applies to K360 directly. Uh, the simplifications I will take is I will take a one-band model in one dimension. Uh, at the end of the talk, I hope I will convince you that dimensionality may be important in these materials. Uh, the one then features also a simplification that may or may not be important, but the approach I want to do here is I want to have an approximation-free way of tackling the problem. So I will tell you everything that I more or less know to be true for sure. And to do this, I will use some class of methods known as NPS methods. 
So the, the advantage of using this type of approach is we can get controlled understanding of the light-induced phases in low-dimensional materials, not KC360, other materials, for example, some that are in currently invest investigated by Matteo here at Harvard, but overall we can understand what options, what modalities are available to us. Very good. So let's start by the model. And the model was introduced by Kenneth Anal in Nature Physics in 2017. The idea of the model is very simple. Light is a, has an electric field. It comes and excites uh, infrared phonons, so the phonons have a dipole, but KC360 K360 has an inversion symmetric, uh, is inversion symmetric, has a center of inversion, so there must be some nonlinearity involved. And this has been highlighted by others, including Antoine George and collaborators, Eugene and collaborators, and Sentif and collaborators. The point is, in this paper, they suggested that one way you can get this nonlinearity is if the phonon coordinate couples nonlinearly to the vector. So the lowest order type thing you can get is such coupling here. There's the density of the electrons, the fermions have the C operators coupled quadratically to the uh, uh, phonon coordinate. This is not the only option, but on physical principle, one expects that this should be relevant in a white class materials. And also, um, there's related work more recently by Mario and collaborators in Hamburg um, on this type of effect in multiband systems. Good. So to be more precise, here's the Hamiltonian. I just have the current the electrons with spin. Um, um, I have uh, Einstein phonons <coughs> with some frequency omega, and this is the nonlinear. And um, um, I'm going to take a half filled chain. I'm going to take an initial state that's metallic. And how here's how light comes into uh, the model. Light comes with a displacement field that is parameterized by alpha. This is the pumpluence. If you don't know what that means, alpha squared is roughly the number of phonons the laser will excite. And it acts on this initial state, which is a metal. That initial state is the ground state of that Hamiltonian at equilibrium. And when you do this, what this pump does, it impulsively excites the phonons, creates a coherent superposition, uh, appropriate coherent state of phonons. So that's all what's happening. But when you do so, this impulsive excitation creates a state that is no longer the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. So that will induce quench dynamics, will induce novel transient behavior. And what they did in this paper was to look at uh, double occupancy in two-site models, amongst other things they've done. And of course, uh, two-site models or two-site ED is great, uh, but if you're interested in long-range correlations, two-site ED is not really useful because you can't understand anything of a long-range order and ordered phases this way. Uh, so now comes my work. I wanted to study this problem, uh, and I wanted to look at ordered phases. What can we get? And um, the first part of the talk, which will be the most, the, the main part of the talk, will be about fast phonons. Really, we're not interested in fast phonons. We're interested in the smallest phonon frequency we can simulate large systems for. So um, this phonon frequency is actually not that large. is roughly uh, in the, uh, in comparable to the electron popping, so it's in the bandwidth. But the reason we use this is we wanted to use MPS methods to study an infinite system. So the, the typical method is called ITEVD, it's a time evolution method. And this, for this type of phonon frequency, for a pump that excites on average two phonons at initial time, you can, if you want to get the correct results, you need 12 phonons per second. So to give you an idea, the local Hilbert space dimension here is 48. This problem has a scaling of 48 to the L. Right, so it, it, it is a challenging problem. That's why we couldn't go to smaller phonon frequencies at that point. However, using this infinite TEVD formulation, you can get infinite uh, you can study infinite chains to finite times. So this is actually what we've done. We use this ITVD method to do exact dynamics in infinite chains, but only to intermediate times. We managed to get to intermediate, and I would argue even possibly, a long time scales on the scale of five hops. And we also did curl of propagation for people who don't know what that is. This is just a form of ED uh, on small chains, but now here you have the advantage that you can go to infinite times. And the goal was to combine those two things to get as best and exact understanding of the intermediate to long time behavior and access long range correlations. So here's some results. Here are the dynamics of the correlation functions. What I'm showing you here are three types of correlation functions. CK is the charge response, SK is the spin response, and PK is the pairing response. These are all resolved in momentum and along time. So let's focus for a second on the initial time here. These are just the metal correlations. And then we 
you apply the pump at initial time and you watch what happens at, at different delays. And if there's an order phase, what you would want to see is some divergence in any of these quantities at the relevant moment. Um, we have to be careful for charge uh, at zero momentum. There's a conservation law, which is the conservation of density. So this cannot change. The same for spin. There's no such thing for pair. And here are some cuts. Um, I'm not going to focus too much on the cuts, but let's just focus on the charge pairing and the spin for a second. The, fe the main feature, this is obviously messy, but the main feature we're seeing is at later times, we're getting flattening of these correlations in momentum. We don't have, uh, you know, this flattening, of course, cannot affect the zero part, as I said. So all what we're seeing is the correlation functions flatten in momentum. So what does that mean? So uh, we were interested in the suggestion that these flattening of correlations imply a disordered state. How do we understand this? So there's an effective model that was written by Kenneth and all, but this effective model missed some important features in the dynamics that I want to emphasize. But let me go take you through the effective model. The idea is simple. This X squared operator has phonon creation and phonon emission operators that uh, do not conserve the phonon number. So we wanted to eliminate those terms. The phonon not conserving, phonon number not conserving terms. There's a standard way of doing this. It's known as the Bogle-Wolf transformation, so you can do it. And if you do it, you'll find that you will squeeze the phonons, and you will get a Hamiltonian that looks like this. However, that this transformation does not diagonalize the hopping term, so we need to expand. We need to do some order, some form of perturbation theory in G, the coupling over omega, the phonon frequency. So that's what I've done for you here. And what you see is you normalize the hopping, as expected. You soften the phonon frequency, and you get these new terms. Epsilon, which is order G cube plus G cube squared over omega, and a minus U power term. So this is very nice, because you can already see that the pump will excite phonons, and if the average number of these things, of these squeezed phonons is large, you will enhance these interactions. So that's nice. What hasn't been emphasized or um, completely flushed out in the original paper, and now we see, is that if you wanted to compare apples to apples in the original frame and the transform frame, um, you want to do the transformation, this Bogolubov squeeze, Bogolubov transformation on everything. You want to do it on your initial state, you want to do it on your Hamiltonian, you want to do it on your the type of motion operator and the observables. So if we do this and we expand to order G over omega, this is only true to order G over omega, we find that nothing has changed except for the Hamilton, the effective Hamilton. So what I'm trying to tell you here is to order G over omega in this approximation, you can understand the problem of the optically pumped metal with this with this nonlinear electron phonon coupling, with this nonlinearity, as the same problem with H effective, which has these conserved bosonic operators. These squeezed phonons are conserved. Of course, this is an approximate thing. I expanded and I eliminated some terms, so we have to be careful. But now notice something interesting. My initial state, uh, can the organizers ask me to wait after? Should I take questions now or after? Uh, yeah. What do you want to do? Uh, okay, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, is your fluid sufficient to actually be in the regime? Like, I thought the superconductivity happens a little bit uh, in the cartoon they show in the 2017. So um, I am not sure what I'm, I'm not trying to compare to the 2017 paper if that helps. But let me let me uh, be careful about this. If I pump too much, I'm going to hit the system quickly. So I don't want to pump too much. And if I pump too little, I will do nothing. That's right. So it's a long discussion. I suggest. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. I just don't want to. I want to be able to finish at least one part of the talk. So but, but notice something interesting about the initial state. The initial state is a coherent superposition of different phonon numbers. <coughs> so if we're evolving under the Hamiltonian, that just means that the different phonon factors are decoupled because they're conserved. So if you look at any observable in this picture, what you're effectively doing is you're type evolving different phonon configurations, different phonon configuration contributions, and you're averaging over them. That's basically what you do in an Anderson problem, where you have a random disorder, you create some uh, um, realization of disorder, you do many of those in average. So you have, we have some self-averaging of the electronic observables in the dynamics. We have some self-generated disorder. Actually, it turns out that this is not as exotic as I'm saying. This has been shown in models of Isengage theory by 
most of our collaborators, a phenomenon called disorder for your localization. The, the reason I'm using the quotations here is I want to emphasize this is a transient effect. I don't have evidence that this is the steady state. We do not, we do not know. It's very hard to do so. But to convince you, maybe you're not convinced because it sounds too exotic, here are some simulations of the exact model, the linear model, and the effective model that has this disorder free localization behavior. And what you're seeing on the y axis are different responses, double occupancy, charge, and spin, time average. And what you're seeing here is basically qualitatively, and in some cases, semi quantitatively, perfect agreement. So this is to say that we have some sufficient uh, belief that the dynamics in this model are approximately governed by this, this self-generated uh, dynamic disorder. So let me summarize the story here. Basically, I have a spatially uniform pump. I apply it to a translation invariant system. There's no source of disorder. But I argue that there is conserved uh, squeezed phonons. And in the presence of those squeezed phonons, the dynamics is reminiscent of self-averaging disorder dynamics. So I have dynamic disorder in use in solution. So this was the, I'm, I'm running out, okay, fine. So um, this is the first part of the talk. So at the time we saw this, we were excited. That's an interesting phenomenon, but we also didn't see superconductivity or any other order phases. It was a little bit depressing. Now I am changing my mind a little bit because I more recently I managed to look at slower phonons. So there was no reason we want, didn't want to do as small phonon frequencies, which are, yes. So can I just? Yes. Is this dynamical induced insulator yeah. state? Is that some sort of polar? Hmm. I mean, is there some sort of localization by the dressed? I don't know if I, field? I. We are at large density, right? So I don't know if I can think about polar. How to think about polar? They're attacking polar if you want, right? So hmm. uh, we can discuss more later, but I, I don't know if that answers your question. Okay. But hmm. anyways, the, we. The slower phonons are more realistic, right? There are uh, definitely more, many more materials that have phonon frequencies that are within this regime, which is a tenth of the hopping, roughly. We didn't do this initially because we didn't know how, right? But now uh, there's a new type of MPS which uses a technique called projected purification. I have no time to get into it. But there is an, a trick, basically, you can do to trick these MPS algorithms to deal with large local hidden spaces with no conservation. And so in this, uh, with this technique, we can now study very large chains with as many as 60 phonons. And we can actually do the phonon uh, Hilbert space. We can adapt it dynamically in the algorithm. Like the algorithm chooses as it iterates the right number of states. So we benchmark. It works perfectly. Now I'm showing you uh, new results, different from the first part of the talk where the phonon frequency is much smaller. And here are some interesting and surprising things. So first, the parent cor correlations don't seem to be flattening. I can't tell if they're growing or what's going on, but there are some interesting oscillations, and maybe they're growing. More interestingly, if I look at the charge correlations, and particularly at phi, these are the staggered correlations, uh, it looks like they're growing and maybe about to diverge. I don't know. So C phi of T seems to be growing. Maybe we have a charge density wave. Here's the charge density wave correlation function in real space at different time slices. So as the color gets darker, you're at later times. The zero time state is the metal, is the boring prior oscillation state. At later times, it looks like we're getting some oscillations. You see between the lighter and the darker blue. But also, it looks like something here is not decaying exponentially. It's very hard to say. There are only eight sites. So we're doing finite site scaling right now. So this might be really a charge density wave. It might be a truly long range or thing, or it might be better than exponentially decaying, like a power law thing. But it is interesting. So maybe we have some suggestion of a light induced charge density wave, or at least a charge density wave like state in this one dimension. I want to emphasize that, at least from our understanding of equilibrium physics in 1D, at half filling, charge density wave competes with superconductivity. So we might not be seeing so Yeah, so that's what I'm trying to say. In right. 1D, at half filling, there is degeneracy between, in some of these models, been between short density waves and pairing. And experience tells us that it always tips towards short density waves. So that's why I'm saying dimensionality may matter. Right? I'm only doing 1D. So this work is under preparation. We don't have 
a model yet to explain these phenomena, but I'm fairly confident that they are accurate. And now I'll flash one last slide. Uh, we thought this MPS projective purification method is very nice. Why can't we just do some, you know, help some experimentalists with this work? So we came up with an idea to do phonon tomography of diffuse X-rays with Meteorano's group. The idea is with this MPS projective purification, compared to the traditional MPS, it's very efficient and cheap for us to compute the phonon density matrix. So we can get, we can build statistics basically over phonon number occupations. And in diffuse X-ray spectroscopy, as Mateo explained to us, intensity is proportional to the phonon occupation. So we wanted to see if we can resolve the electron dynamics statistically with respect to phonon contributions. Here is a simulation for a similar model, a metal that we excite. And you're seeing on the y-axis here on the left in blue, the double occupancy on, uh, mm -hmm. on the right uh, axis is the staggered magnetization. So these are the anti-permanent correlations. The solid lines are exact data. These points are reconstructed with this tomography, which we get by taking the phonon, the reduced the phonon density matrix, and constructing these probability distribution over phonon states. So this shows that the method works. And with this, I conclude. Thank you for uh, listening to me, and I would like to acknowledge my collaborators, the Moore Fellowship, and Yishin Thank you.